Okay, so happy Wednesday. Uh, I think we've got almost everyone here today. We'll give just a couple of moments for the last ones to join us. Uh, but before we uh, before we move on on the material, but I was hoping to take that moment as a chance to check just if you have any questions, anything that I can help you with uh, as we are getting ready to move on. So uh, tonight I'm hoping to spend a little bit of time focusing on the lab element of uh, this week's learning module. Uh, so just to give you a heads up, what's what's coming up, but if it's not related to the lab, is there anything else that I can help you with? Anything else that you might have questions uh, that that you might be wondering about, whether it's subject related or it's a technical thing, just feel free to unmute yourself for an ad or raise your hand or type it into the chat. We'll do the attendance in just a little bit. I'm just giving a couple of moments for the last ones to uh, join us. So uh, we'll hold on with the attendance just a little bit. Well, I'm not seeing any, I see a hand being raised. Thank you, Donovan. Can I help you with anything? Uh, so there, uh, there is an email on feel that free I got. To unmute yourself or ask in a chat, uh, whatever works for you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, there is an email about a leadership conference or whatnot, and one of the days they've got stuff scheduled for a class within. I think it's next week. I'd have to double check my email, but. I was wondering if I were to do that, would it? How would that affect the classwork and stuff like that? If I miss it, would I still be able to see the recording afterwards, and it be all right? Absolutely. I really encourage you to make use of any opportunities like that that come up. Uh, go for those. This is a synchronous online class, so we do have these meetings, but I always record all of these and they are accessible to you when you click into the collaborate there should be a recording list but i also upload them to the youtube so when you go to the previous module it should be the very first thing on each module i actually did it even for our last meeting on monday it should be the very first item that shows up there is, is a recording of what we've covered in the last session usually i do it in the same evening sometimes it moves on to the next morning depending on how youtube is uploading files uh, how long it takes so you will have all the information you will have access to all that and if for something like that that's so clearly related to your academic endeavors and so on even if it wouldn't be if you just drop me a message that hey i need a little extension to submit in the work past the deadline i'm totally happy to do that so i strongly encourage you to take make use of that attend to that and we'll definitely make sure that uh, you're able to do the homework really every week you just have the homework quiz and then you have the lab quiz and if you try to do them and you're kind of like oh i don't know the answer because i missed that session all you have to do is let me know and uh, i'll either provide you further resources or we can meet up and go through that uh, virtually or whatever uh, I really don't think that there's usually anything that you wouldn't find an answer from the lecture videos, uh, but sometimes it just is easier to just have someone to re-explain things, but do not turn down any great opportunities because of this class. Okay, thank you. Excellent, thank you. That was a really good question. Uh, in terms of the technicalities of this class, so we are asked to make sure that a student attends once a week to something that we do. And since this is kind of one of these uh, live online classes, I usually take it from the did you attend to one of these sessions. If you don't attend to these sessions, but you still submit work during the course or during that week, I can still give you that attendance. But if you do not attend to anything and you don't submit any work, then it becomes harder for me to say that, oh, this student has been actively participating. Well, 
in my classes, you don't really get points for ad attending uh, other than the extra credit points, which I'm still to add to your last exam. But there's no systematic that I'm expecting you to attend. Uh, if you don't attend, you wouldn't pass the course or something like that. Uh, that's not the case in my classes. The only time when really the, the attendance that I have submitted matters or applies is if you're receiving financial aid or if there's other college things that you're doing such as athletics and then they want to make sure that you're attending uh, it can have effects on those things but nothing in terms of your grade on this course or anything of course i really appreciate everyone who attends and i do uh, like i said whenever i get a chance uh, i'm still to I've pretty much done it, but I haven't released your scores on those, the updated scores for the exam, uh, but it does count positively. And I really appreciate you coming, but if you have a great opportunity, do not turn it down. You'll, you'll be able to catch up as long as you either submit work or attend to once a week, at least to one of the meetings, you're all good. That was a really good question. Do we have any other questions that anyone else would have on mind? Well, I'm not seeing any others coming through, but at any stage, remember always, you can just shout out uh, and I will definitely try to pick that up. Uh, I'm looking at the controls here and it's a Blackboard Ultra, which is the modality that we're using on this course. It's still, we're one of the early adapters of that. So it's still kind of sometimes working, sometimes not working exactly how, how I want. So I'm not able to pull up directly the PowerPoint as I would like to. So instead, what I end up doing, like we've done before, I'll just share you the entire screen of mine. And from that, I'll open up the PowerPoint. The only downside with that is that I'm not able to see the chat at the same time. So every once in a while, I'll need to jump out of that. But if you have a question and I'm not picking it up, just don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask it. I don't want you to feel that just because I'm not acknowledging you, it means that I wouldn't care about what you're saying. It's probably just that I'm not seeing it at this end. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen uh, so we can have a look of what I was hoping to do today. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about the microscopy aspect, which is the lab that we have allocated for this week. And having said that we're going to be talking about microscopy, um, it kind of makes me feel that this is still the time when we're in a limbo that we had labs that we were doing traditionally in a face-to-face uh, -face format. And then pandemic came, we moved a lot of labs into a virtual format and we're still developing, we developed them as far as we could, but we're still developing a better solution for a fully virtual version of certain labs. And this is definitely one of those. So I've done what I think is reasonable for one to learn about microscopy, which is a very hands-on thing in a virtual setting, but it's never going to be quite as good as being actually in a lab. However, rather than just skipping the concept and being like, oh, well, you will not learn about microscopy on this course, we wouldn't do that because this course is a prerequisite for many other courses that you might move on. So I want you to have the same skills and knowledge, regardless whether you've been in a face-to-face -face class or whether you've been in a hybrid format or whether you've been fully online. So I need to ensure that you know a little bit about microscopes and how to use them even if it was a virtual class that we are taking. So it is going to be a little theoretical. I would describe it probably that's the best word. It is going to be a little bit of wondering that, okay, I'm trying to do something that's very hands-on, but I'm trying to do it in an online setting. So let's do our best. And uh, as always, once you then get into the hands-on labs, you'll hopefully be able to make the connections with what you've learned on this lab with the hands-on work that builds up on the knowledge of this lab. So um, we'll, we'll do our best and we'll make it work. But if at any stage it feels super abstract, don't feel that it's anything to do with you. It's probably just taking something that's very practical and putting it 
into this online format that doesn't quite lend itself to the same hands-on experience. So, like I said, at any stage, feel free to shout out if you have any questions. So, uh, in terms of the microscopy, really the key point that I wanted to make as we're starting to think about this is that these are methods that we are using when we're wanting to study things that are too small for us to see with just our naked eye. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that you could probably see a cell with a naked eye. If you have amazing eyes, you could maybe tell a nucleus within the cell with a naked eye, but that'd be pushing it. That'd be really hard. So we need to have these tools that allow us to overcome the limits of what you can see just with your normal vision. And that's where we where the microscopy comes in. A microscopy is actually a rather interesting field in a sense that how far we've come from the first microscopes. And one thing that many of my students who have taken more classes with me end up noticing that medical history is something that I'm especially interested in. And I think we always learn about today much better when we know the history. How did we get into here? So uh, that's the reason why we'll be exploring a little bit that how did we end up with current microscopes from the past? Uh, our focus on this class in terms of the skills that I'm hoping you to take away from a, how to operate a microscope and so on, it's all to do with optical microscopy and compound light microscopes. These are the microscopes that you typically see in your high school labs and indefinitely in college and uh, also university labs. Uh, once you move on to the university world and into a little more advanced university classes, you might start to see electron microscopes and so on. But really the compound light microscopy is probably the most common field of microscopy that we do. And a lot can be accomplished already with that. And a lot of uh, professions also already use simply that. That gets us very far of seeing a lot of things that we want to see. I would say that compound light microscopy is ideal for studying tissues, not so much for studying cells. We will see certain things about the cells, but rather than studying individual cells, we're looking at a group of cells that forms a tissue. So really the study of tissues is going to be what, what this method lends itself ideally. And uh, I mentioned about the history of the microscopy a little bit. And there is a video that I'm asking you to watch as part of your this week's lab. And there is a link there in the lab. So you just click on that, it opens. And it's actually one of the um, videos produced by the same organization that's behind TED Talks. And in case you've never run into a TED Talk before, I think the abbreviation stands for Technology, Engineering, and uh, I wanted to say a Design, but it can be something else. This is not my field, and that's not something that's really important. But it's a really a broad umbrella under which many great talks have been collected and there's TED conferences and so on. So if you're ever bored and you want to do something useful with your time, I encourage you to look at TED talks either from YouTube or go to their own website and see what they have. Well, this video was made as an educational version of uh, our edu educational class video that that kind of bases on the same organization. So it all gives an overview of the uh, history of how we studied cells and then what eventually led into the formation of something known as cell theory. And there are, I think, four questions on your lab this week the first four questions that are based on this video. So you can watch it, you can have the questions open at the same time and pick up the answers as you need it. Uh, remember that labs, just as the uh, quizzes, 
it's not really just you raising and showing that you know all about it. That is part of the uh, lab is that while you're doing it, you're learning just as if you would be in a classroom and you learn while you do the lab. We're learning while we're completing this activity. So don't feel that this is something that you should know. You're finding it for the first time for some of you, and that's absolutely fine. So that's the important thing about the microscopy. And I think I, it might have been another computer or it might have been my computer, but I think I heard a little blip. So I'm just jumping back and forth. Uh, I see that Erica had her hand up. Can I help with anything? Any questions? Yeah, um, when you show the slides, there's like a little thing on the bottom that says share or hide. Can you okay. click on hide because I can't see the link. Absolutely, I'll do that. And uh, do not, absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so do not worry about uh, the, if you're not able to see the link, I do want you to get access to everything. The link is actually embedded into the uh, lab activity. So you should be able to, um, click just a link in the lab rather than having to take it, take it down and try type it yourself. But that was super helpful. Uh, I'll make sure to hide the uh, sharing screen from you guys as well in the future. So um, I saw that a couple of students already posted the attendance. I appreciate you doing so. Let's just hold uh, a little bit back from that because I want to make sure that we get a chance uh, to to um, tackle that through an activity. But if you know that you have to leave and the activity hasn't came up yet, then just by all means post your attendance. But if you can just hold it a little longer. Uh, any other questions? That was a really good question. Uh, good point. I really appreciate you sharing that. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to next go through with you just the basic parts of a compound light microscope. And we'll go through them as if we were getting ready to look something on a microscopic slide. And I totally realize that this is a little challenging because it's going to be looking at pictures of something that I really think you would learn best by doing it hands on. So, um, We'll do our best and we'll take it from there. And then we'll get to apply this information in just a bit. And I think that that will really clarify it to you. But whenever you have a compound light microscope, they vary a little bit depending on the make, depending on the brand, depending on the model of the microscope that you see. But most of them have fairly similar parts. Those parts might be located just a little bit differently from where the, uh, they are on this diagram, but we'll make it make an assumption that you would be able to find them fairly easily if you look to the same area. So the first thing, of course, that you want to do, you want to find an on-off switch, so a light switch. And really, with the compound light microscopes, the only thing that you're turning on is the light source. So uh, that's typically located either at the very front or at the back on one of the sides or all the way to the back of the base of the microscope. So simple on off switch, you turn that on. The second thing that you might sometimes see, and this sometimes trips some of the students over that there might be this disc that you can rotate and that controls the amount of light or the strength of the light beam that comes through from the light source. So if you're not seeing quite what you would expect to see, it seems very dim. Look if there's some sort of a uh, leveler or some sort of a disc that you can rotate so that you actually get the maximum amount of light being projected from the light source. The third thing that I sometimes see some of the students, even if they've done all of these steps and they're still like, oh, my view from the microscope seems very dim. It doesn't seem bright. The one more place that you can look at is right underneath this sledge where the slide goes. 
there is a diaphragm for iris and iris is just the size of the hole through which the light actually penetrates through the sample so there might be a leveler that you can move with that as well so that's definitely a uh, word of checking if you're not seeing what you're expecting to see so it would be underneath this sled so uh, look there if there's something that would move and if you are able to move that are you seeing more light coming through that small hole on the uh, where you would place the slide that is is that changing so first thing we want to do, we want to get light on and we want to get the light coming through the sample. Second thing we want to do, we want to actually take that microscopic slide that we have and preparation of microscopic slides is a skill on its own. And I would almost go as far as saying that it's an art on its own. I've prepared microscopic slides for certain things that I've worked on. I worked a lot with embryos, uh, embryonic research. So uh, I would say that I'm probably in tens of thousands of slides that I've prepared, prepared in my lifetime. And you do become more skilled and more adept on that. So um, luckily at the college level, most of the slides that we give to the students at the especially 100 level classes have been prepared for you already ahead of the time. So you get perfect slides. You don't have to worry. Are there any issues that you're having with uh, seeing what you're expecting to see because of the slide, or could it be because of the uh, microscope settings? Uh, when you move further in your studies, I think that 205 on our microbiology classes, I teach that as well. Uh, we do actually try to get our students to do some of their own slides as well. Uh, but at this level, you get given beautiful, well done slides. So what do you want to do when you're about ready to start to look at that glass slide where the microscopic sample is? Um, you want to load it on this slide holder or on this tray. You want to make sure that the side of the glass where the sample is, that the sample is on the top. You don't want to be dragging the sample against of this uh, slide holder that we have there. Otherwise, you end up uh, with a risk of damaging the sample, wiping the sample off or scratching the glass there. So sample goes onto the top, uh, top side of this glass. Typically, there is a spring, it, not in all light microscopes, but most, there is a spring that really locks the slide into this slide holder's corner so that the slide stays very stiff on this uh, tray where we're moving it. And when you release the clip, it stays there nicely well what students often say that well it's not where it should be the sample is not on top of this little white hole or little hole where the light is coming through and if that's the case that's still completely fine please just position the slide into the sled as it should be positioned um and I'm just going to check. I hear a chat message coming through, but bear with me. I'll just want to make sure if there's something that would be of, uh, of that I, I want to clarify. It's just a few students sending attendance. So uh, we'll be holding off from the attendance just for a little bit longer. Uh, if you do have to leave, though, do make sure that you post it. The next thing that we want to do when we're uh, looking through the compound light microscope is that now we have the light on and we have the slide located nicely here within the holder where it should be. We want to make sure that we're using a correct lens. And what you do, you always start with the lens that's the lowest magnification power. So you always go for the lowest magnification first. And you will be able to see that these lenses are housed in this rotating structure. So the lens that you're using is normally the one that's furthest at the back. So you will see there's a marking for it and it clicks on its place. So uh, make sure that you choose the lowest, smallest magnification uh, magnification scale and that's important because when you go to the higher most magnifications it helps you that you have positioned everything correctly with the lower mode 
most. If you jump into too high of a magnification, it's just going to be harder to accomplish what you're going to do. So you can just rotate this uh, ocular housing device until you get the lowest magnification to the very back, back of that. The next thing that we want to do, now we have the light source, we have the slide on its place, and we have the right lens selected. Well, now we want to move this slide so that it's located the sample right on top of that hole where the light is coming through. And there's two, usually two uh, knobs that you can rotate, one for moving the sample forward and backward, and one for moving it sideways. So you want to make sure that the light beam, the circle where the light is coming through, is right underneath where the sample on the microscopic slide is so that it's clearly uh, the light is going through clearly something that you're actually trying to see the next step would be to get what you're looking in focus so these are equipment that's made with multiple different lenses and for you to see what you're really wanting to see all of these lenses must be perfectly positioned and how they need to be positioned depends on the sample that you have on that slide so we can't have a standard setting and you would always see everything perfectly instead we need to always find that magical spot where everything's perfectly balanced for every single slide on its own so what i always ask you to make sure is that you use the right uh, focus knobs. We start with the coarse focus because that gives the larger changes in the focus of the sample on a microscope. And once you're really close, that it looks almost sharp, the image that you're seeing through these eyepieces, then you move on to using the fine focus knob. But really, you want to get roughly to the right place by using the course and then do the fine tuning with this small fine focus knob. Uh, this is because if you try to do it all with this fine focus knob, you'll be there turning that knob forever. Well, this is the first time that we're actually getting to look into the microscope. And what we're doing, we're First, starting with the very basics, you saw earlier on that the eyepieces that we had, typically one of them is locked and another one moves. Well, anatomical fact is that all of our, uh, all of us have a little bit of different uh, anatomy in, in our body. So the distance between your eyes is probably different from your lab partner's distance between their eyes. So we're making sure that these lenses that you're looking through are ideally located for your eyes. So for that reason, you're able to adjust these oculars so that they're a good distance for your eyes. And uh, that's when you do that, what you end up seeing is that when you're looking through them, initially you see two circles, but when they are perfectly positioned for your eyes, so that your distance of your eyes is matching with those oculars, instead of two circles that are overlapping, you will only end up seeing one circle. So that's the thing that we start with. We don't, don't even worry about other things. We just want to position the circles together. Well, now we do further adjustment of that focus. You might have been wondering earlier on that how do I know to focus it if I don't see the sample. When you become more experienced, you know roughly where to go even without looking to the sample, but eventually you have to do it just by visually judging. And again, we're using the lowest magnification power and we use the coarse focus until we get the image to appear. So you're seeing something. It might not be perfect what you're seeing, but you're seeing something. And if you're not seeing anything at all, then we go back to the start and go through. Did we do all of the other steps correctly? Could there be another explanation why we're not seeing anything? Once you have the view roughly right, then you do fine tuning by the fine focus knob. And you will also probably end up having to move a little bit of the sample on that tray. And for that reason, we had these 
control knobs that we talked, moving uh, the sled forward and backwards and sideways. The reason why it's important to use those is that if you try to do it by fingers on that sled, any movement that you do is so massive in comparison to what you see that it's easy to get lost on that slide. So we really try to use the tools that have been built in there to help us to do that job. The other thing that you might notice is that the view that you see is just way too bright. You're really just saying that for my eyes, this is too bright. I can't see the sample nicely. So we go back to this iris diaphragm, which was located right underneath that slide tray. And there was typically a leveler that you, allows you to adjust the size of the opening on that diaphragm. And if you make it uh, make it a little bit dimmer, that might help if 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 you're struggling to see uh, the specimen. Now uh, we're getting to the real business of a microscopy. We're getting to the point where we want to make sure that the image is perfectly sharp under low power, and we now can move on to higher magnification power. So again, you rotate this uh, this uh, this objective stand and you choose one step higher of a magnification from the magnifications that you have available by rotating it remember the objective that you're using is the one that's further at the back there's usually an arrow or some sort of a signal to remind you that this is what you're looking through so you don't want to jump from a low magnification to the highest magnification. You want to do it gradually. So you move on to the next largest magnification. And again, once you've done that, you want to fine tune that everything is perfect for that view. And once everything is perfect for that view, then you're able to uh, move on to a higher magnification. But it really is a process of moving step by step. The other thing that can go horribly wrong, if you simply move on to the largest magnification, is that the changes that you have to do are so small that now when you didn't have it perfect to start with in the previous magnification, you're going to struggle to get it right for the higher magnification. So that's why we do it gradually, that you never lose focus, you never lose, you're never far off from the slight changes that you have to make. So uh, we want to do it step by step. And that's really all there is to know in terms of how to get started with the microscope. I know that few of you have been eager to do the attendance. And uh, the next question is kind of a tricky for doing attendance. So we're just going to discuss that. But for one after that, you actually get to post your answer. And that allows us to take your attendance as well. So uh, this is an actual question from your quiz for this lab. Uh, I've listed all the possible steps that you could have in the process of using microscope. But they're all jumbled up. I actually moved them largely, I think, based on the alphabetical uh, order of the words. So they're not in right order. What the quiz asks you to do is put these in a correct order. And of course, just as a revision of what we've seen, first you want to have the light on on the microscope. Then you want to load the slide into the holder. Then you want to choose the lowest magnification that you're going to be using. You want to position the slide into the center so that the light beam is coming through the slide. You want to do the coarse focus adjustments. After that, you do fine focus adjustments to bring the sample into a sharp view. Uh, you adjust it to oculars. So instead of two, view, uh, two circles, you see one circle. And you do any fine tuning that you might need to do either with focusing or positioning the slide or adjusting the amount of light coming through the iris diaphragm. And once you have all that perfect, you can switch to an objective with higher magnification. So that is going to be a question in your lab quiz to be able to put these in a correct order. And this would be the series of order uh, or a series of steps that I'm looking after. But um, now the question 
that we can use for taking our ad attendance is that we have an onion root tip sample. So we've grown an onion and we've grown the root. So we know that there's growth happening at that piece that you're going to be studying. And we do that often for uh, preparing lab slides as a practice uh, for, for our students and they get to prepare that slide. Well, which part of the microscope would you adjust to make this sample that we're seeing now on the microscope a little bit better? To me, that sample looks like we can roughly tell that, okay, there is a root of an onion, but we can't quite see sharply what's going on. It's a little blurry to me. I think I can see really nicely all the dust particles on the slide, but the actual sample, I'm not seeing too well. So which of these could you adjust to make that sample show up better? Would it be adjusting the iris diaphragm, which controls the amount of light? that comes to this view? Or would it be to adjust the ocular housing so we select another lens, uh, maybe higher magnification? Or would it be moving forward and backward side to side the actual slide? Uh, could it be using the course, fo course focus knob so that we are able to get the focus a little bit better? Or are we using fine focus knob, which is the slightest of changes to that focus? Or are we adjusting the ocular, so those eye, uh, circles that we want it to be one, uh, one full one? So if you have a clear idea what would be the correct answer to this, you can just post it into the chat. If you don't have a yet, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So we are not struggling to get enough light. We can see that there is light and we can see the sample. So it's not going to be the A. And it's not going to be about choosing another lens either, because we are on the lowest magnification. We want to stay there until we see this perfectly. Uh, we don't have to move the sample sideways or forward backwards. The sample is clearly here in the view. So that's not what's the challenge. Uh, we do not have an issue with adjusting the ocular either. So we are seeing one circle instead of two half circles or two circles that are overlapping. So it's going to be either D or E. Are we starting with coarse focus or are we starting with fine focus to get this view that we have a little bit more focused? And like I said, I think at the moment our setting is so that we're focused on seeing the, all of this dirt on the surface of a slide. And that happens. That's just something we live in a world where there's a lot of dust floating around when you use same slides over and over again. You tend to get little fingerprints and so on on them, no matter how careful you are. I can tell that this sample is not on focus. Our focus is now on the dirt. So we need to change something. So the question was, are you using first coarse or fine focus? And I think I heard a good number of answers coming through. And again, let me just jump around. It could be either one. That's a good answer there. Well, really, the answer that I was looking is that on this case, I think we're really close. So you would probably be fine using just by fine focus. But it really could be either one. I think on this one, uh, the reason why I've chosen that the fine focus would be is because we are almost seeing the structure. You use coarse focus normally when you don't have anything visible until you see something like this. And then when you have something that you can see there, but not perfectly, you move on to using fine focus. So I would have accepted either D or E, but I think that E is a little bit better out of those two answers. So we're going to go with that. I hope that that makes sense. I hope everyone got to post something to the chat. If you did not get a chance to answer anything to the chat, at least post your name so I can make sure that you got an attendance for today. Well, let's have a look at what else could we be doing. Uh, here we have the same onion root tip, and now we have the fine focus on its place. So we're actually seeing the view in a full focus, what we're wanting to see. If you compare it to the previous one, we could just faintly see it. you needed to do more fine focus. Now on the A, we're actually seeing it. It's nicely in focus. 
what I've got here, I've got that same onion root tip viewed from multiple different focuses, though, so or multiple different uh, magnifications, though. So I've used different objects to get to different levels of detail. So you'll notice that A is looking at the onion root tip from the furthest away possible. And then we start to see cells. We see cells a little bit better. The B would be probably close as we can go with this microscope and with these uh, objectives that we have available. Uh, so we are going from the uh, smallest magnification to the highest magnification. And then we have steps in between that. So when we are trying to choose what, what describes the magnification that we have, when you have times something higher the number, the greater the magnification. So again, if you're able to post to the chat, which do you think is a correct order of these magnifications that we have here listed? So I would propose that for the A, we have the lowest magnification, which in this case is going to be times four. So it can be either A or C. So we have the lowest magnification. However, if we look at the B, there we have the highest magnification. So all you have to do is now choose from A and C that where do we get the highest magnification as the second one? And then we have C and B, something in between. And I'm seeing good answers coming through. And of course, it is going to be the A. So we're seeing the lowest magnification here, second lowest magnification at the D. So you'll notice we can start to see the nucleus of these cells, but that's about it. We don't even really see the cell walls very nicely. Well, when we move on to the second highest magnification, which in this case would be times 40 lens, we actually see nicely the nucleus, but we also see the cell walls. Remember, these are going to be plant cells, so they're not animal cells. So plant cells have a little bit more rigid cell wall, thanks to the cellulose on their wall, than what we saw with the animal cells. And finally, B was, of course, our highest magnification. There we can see the nucleus. It has stained dark uh, because of the most stains bind to the material within the nucleus. And we can see the cell wall, but we can't see much more anything else. I guess that we could see the cytoplasm there as well. You remember cytoplasm was this jelly-like fluid that filled the cell. But those would be probably the only three things that I can say that we see there. You might see that some of the nucleus looks a little different from others. And we will talk later on on this course about what are we seeing. We're seeing the cells at different stages of their division process. So you can see cells with DNA very clearly uh, taking the chromosome shape, or you can see it just as a black dot depending on at what part of the cell's life cycle it is, how ready is it on the process of dividing into two. So good job, everyone who got that right. I'm very, very impressed and very appreciative. The next question refers to the next step when you're following through the lab, uh, when you're working on it. I actually do virtually with you all the same steps that we would do in a face-to-face -face class where students do this for themselves. So they actually take a sample of a cell from their body. And one of the easiest places to get cell samples from your body is from inside your cheek. So they scrap a little sample, not by poking themselves, just a gentle wipe on there is enough to uh, loosen up few cells. And then they smear it on a microscopic slide. And what I tell them to do is to use methylene blue, which is a stain, and we use it uh, on that sample before we start looking in to the microscope to see it. So the question is that why would you use methylene blue, the stain, on a cell sample? Why would that be important? And again, if you think you know an answer, feel free to uh, post it to the chat. I do count those at the end, and I do keep, take a, keep, keep a record. If someone's participating actively, I add those points to their, file, their exam score. I just haven't released that yet, but I will post a notice once I'm done.
So would it be because we're using this methyl in blue stain so we can better tell apart the different parts of the cell? Or would it be because blue light waves of the microscope are the strongest and best visible? Uh, really, I would tell you at this point that no, it, it really isn't about the different colored of light waves uh, in terms of them what microscope emits uh, when we're using this. Uh, I have also proposed that the blue color pigment has been historically most highly prized, which is actually true. I used to work in conservation restoration fields, so I worked with old pigments, for example, on paintings, and blue has been a difficult color to produce. Blue was one of the most expensive pigments to make, but that's not the reason why we're using methylene blue. We don't want to show off that we have an expensive taste. And uh, the last option, I hope you don't think that that's the case. We do not want to make students' life uh, complicated. That's definitely not our goal. It really is that by using the stain, we are able to tell apart what normally would otherwise look when you look it on a microscope kind of as a pale just very faint boundaries between the different parts of the cell so to make those more visible we have many different recipes for different kinds of stains and different kinds of staining processes that we can use and that's exactly what we are doing here so we're using that to be able to tell apart the different um, the different uh, parts of the cell much better if we look here we see that the nucleus has stained really dark and also the cell walls have stained. If we wouldn't have done anything of that, it would all look kind of this grayish mass. It would be really hard to tell these apart. So staining really is a form of uh, art, form of skills. Uh, and we spend years specializing on that in the university level if that's something that you end up working on on histology or cytology and not all stains are just pigments we can have also stains that for example fluorescent under certain light conditions so you get those really bright colors uh, that we, that's one staining technique and uh, a little bit more advanced but the basics are the same. And like I said, you actually get to do some staining of microscopic samples yourself once you move further on these uh, sequences of courses. Uh, at 200 level, we start to stain our own microscopic slides. It is a painstaking process, and sometimes even if you do it, even with the best of skills, there are unexpected events happening, and you really need to be able to have multiple different staining options so you can choose what do you want to highlight. Different stains highlight different parts of the cell. Or you can use a mixture of different stains, so that takes it a little bit up the notch as well. Well, the last question that I have on the quiz for this week's lab for you, and that we're going to be looking on this review session together, is that I have two different magnifications of these cheek cells that my actual students took for me. And uh, we, we did some photography of those microscopic cells because I wanted to have this lab for you that you at least get to see something real. So I have 10 times the magnification and 40 times the magnification. So what you see here are individual cells and within an individual cell you can also see that dark dot. So uh, these are the same cells looking from a little further and a little closer. So now I have listed there eight different parts of a cell and I'm asking you that which ones can you actually see on these pictures and on this one there's multiple correct answers however I will give you a clue that not all of these are visible and I sometimes get students in face-to-face -face classes who swear to me that they can see even the tiniest parts of the cell with light microscope and I'm really glad for them for having such a good imagination but with light microscope alone you will not be able to see all of these so if you could in the chat again post if you think that you know one or several things that you can see on these pictures and we can have a look together that did we actually see those so feel free to go and post on the chat 
So let's have a look what we could see. Um, we can see, perfect, good answers coming through. We can see the cell membrane. So the outermost layer around the cells, these are noticed animal cells now. They're not as rigid in shape as the plant cells were. We can also see the nucleus in there. And we can see cytoplasm that fills the cell. In this stain, cytoplasm has stained bluish. So anything that's not cytoplasm hasn't stained. If it is nucleus, it has stained even darker blue than the cytoplasm. And then just from this contrast between the cytoplasm and areas outside the cell. You can tell this tiniest boundary that separates the inside and outside of the cell. And this boundary was, of course, our cell membrane. So three things that you can see on these cells. You can see the cell membrane, cytoplasm, and nucleus. If you were able to tell those apart, excellent job. Uh, we would not be seeing any of these other cell parts because they simply are too small. Our magnification powers with the light microscope are not able to reveal these parts. So that really brings me to the end of this review session about the lab for getting ready for it. Um, I took this, uh, I think a meme or a quote, from, and I think it was more of meant when they talk about relationships, but I think that it's good in terms of describing the relationship with microscopy as well. This might seem really confusing and very abstract when you don't get to actually play with the microscope in front of you. But once you are there with the microscope, hopefully all of this theoretical foundation gives you the confidence to use the microscope comfortably comfortably. And I can promise that with everything having been going on with the pandemic, with not every student having been able to be on hands-on labs, we will always review things once you move forward on your studies. But because it is going to be a review, I want you to have this basic understanding of how microscopy works. So that's really what this lab was all about, that you feel quite comfortable with how to tackle uh, if you are asked to look at a sample with a microscope. So that's all I had planned for tonight. But what I do want to do, I want to answer to any questions that you may have. So let me just jump back. And I'm just scrolling through the chat. I don't see that there would have been any new questions. But if you do have any questions, you can type it to the uh, chat. Or alternatively, you can just unmute yourself and speak up. Or you can raise your hand. And I'll be more than happy to try to tackle any questions that you have. If you don't have any questions, this really is all I have for today. I know we're a little bit ahead of the schedule, but I don't want to keep you here just to give you busy time and just to waste your time. So uh, that's all I have for today. If you have attended to the chat by posting an answer, you have made your attendance. If you have not posted anything to the chat, this would be good, a good time to at least post your name so I can mark you as having been attended in attendance today. But that's all I have for today. I will stick around in case you have any questions. But if you don't have questions, everything that we made, discussed made sense. I'm going to wish you good night and hope you enjoy uh, your Wednesday evening. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> and for anyone who stays behind, feel free to unmute yourself or write your question to the chat if you have any questions. I know that sometimes we just forget the things so on, so don't feel that I would worry about that. Good night. <laughs> um, so there's there's nothing more I will share tonight. <laughs> Good night.
Good night. For anyone who's wondering what I'm doing since I'm being all quiet and writing down, I'm just literally taking manually the attendance. So I am going to be around here. Thank you. Uh, around here in case you have a question that suddenly comes up to your mind, but uh, I have nothing new to share unless you ask a question. So feel free to move on. I will not mind if you stick around, but uh, like I said, I have nothing new to share for now. <laughs> And I'm going to stop recording at this point. I will still be around here uh, if you are present and you have a question. But uh, as I said, I will make this recording available for you uh, as soon as it uploads to the YouTube after this session. You can access it immediately on the Blackboard. Have a good night. Thank you again.